Just kidding. Uh, all right, before we get started here, first things first, let me, uh, uh, let me open us up in a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we approach your throne this morning, I just um, I thank you for every single person in this room. I pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, anoint us with your presence, that as we go about um, your message today in 1 Corinthians 7 and on marriage and relationships, Lord, I pray that you would um, you know, speak to each of our hearts individually where we're at and show us what it is that you would have us to glean from this passage. And uh, Lord, I pray that you'd bless my words, that I wouldn't just um, confuse every single person sitting here, but that uh, somebody would take something away from it that would benefit them during their walk this week. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, for those of you who don't know me, uh, despite that introduction, uh, my name is Christian Talby. I've been coming to Calvary Chapel, South Tampa for two years now, and I'm on the leadership team here at the church. Uh, during the week, uh, I'm a case design manager at a financial services firm up on Fletcher Avenue called Adcock Financial Group, and I am married to that beautiful woman right there in the green, uh, Vanessa. I have to, in my, this is my first time up here, so I have to try to make ample opportunities to embarrass her while I'm up here. So that was my, that was my first stab. Uh, but when Joe approached me a couple of months back to see if I'd be comfortable preaching on an upcoming Sunday, um, I was, was humbled at the request and determined to provide a meaningful message uh, regardless of the topic that I was going to be assigned. But naturally, as we got closer to my assigned date, I began kind of projecting where we were in the series because we've been going through 1 Corinthians 7 for the past couple of months just so I could begin a basic preparation you know, for my week. Thankfully, I got 1 Corinthians 7, which focused on marriage and relationships instead of our next chapter, which was concerning food offered to idols. Um, obviously, you can imagine that there are slightly more resources online at the Lifeway bookstores on marriage than on the dangers of idol food sacrificing uh, procedures. So, and when I, uh, when I informed my father over Thanksgiving that I was going to be preaching on 1 Corinthians 7, he recommended that I get up here and start talking as if I was going to preach on 2 Corinthians 7 and have uh, Vanessa correct me up on stage just to see if I could freak Joe out a little bit. But, um, but Joe, I love you too much to put you through that, so I'm just going to stick to the assignment. Um, but as I was preparing for this week, uh, I thought that there were certainly more qualified people, uh, even in this room, to preach on the subject of marriage. Uh, Rosie and Terry come to mind, uh, Tom and Dale, uh, Teresa, Joe, you guys are awesome uh, examples. And even my parents just celebrated their 25th wedding anniversary not a month ago, and my mom's here today. Um, but that's not to say that I don't feel like I've learned more in the last three years of being married to Vanessa than I had in my previous 21 years here on Earth. Uh, growing up with four brothers in no way prepares you for the ever-changing conundrum that is the female. Sometimes, sometimes I feel like it would be easier to get a Gator fan to root for FSU than it would be to simply try to figure out what my wife is thinking like at that exact moment. And this is to the guys, because you all know the place, the terrible place in life, when you know you've done something wrong and you want to ask, you know, well, what's up, honey, what's wrong? What response do you get? It's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. But everything is most certainly not fine. And just, just for academic purposes, I looked it up. The dictionary defines the word fine as expressed in a satisfactory or pleasing manner. I don't know about you, but whenever I've been told it's fine, everything's fine, it has most definitely not been in a satisfactory or pleasing manner. But in all seriousness, though, uh, Vanessa and I have always worked on establishing effective and honest communication, and so thankfully, we don't have too many of those types of moments. And we all know how rewarding uh, marriage can be, uh, is honestly one of the most rewarding pursuits in life. But Paul says in this chapter, uh, we're going to get into, when addressing the unmarried and widows in verse 8, that, quote, it is good for them to remain single. And in verse 28, those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would choose to spare you from that. So marriage is most definitely not the be-all pursuit, and, but there are clearly some good things to come out of marriage. And so as we get into the chapter today, we'll review three points that kind of follow the structure of the passage, and I think that we've got them up here. Uh, the first one is marriage's role in avoiding sexual immorality, uh, Paul's commands to the married and the unmarried, and also our responsibility to live as believers in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to us or that we find ourselves in as a result of our own doing. So uh, as, with all that as the setup, let's uh, dive into the scripture. If you've got your Bibles with you, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. And honestly, if you don't have a Bible, please let one of us know. It doesn't have to be now. We have Bibles in the back. We'd be happy to give you on the way out. So 
let us know. But into the scriptures, verse 1. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. And in the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift and another has that. Now something to understand about the city of Corinth, and it's, I found out this week it's pronounced Corinth, not the way the Kentucky in me was kind of saying it, Corinth. And my wife, the SLP, made sure to correct me of that as we prepped in. So Corinth. One thing to understand is they had a problem with sexual immorality. And this is something that Joe's touched on over the last couple of weeks. Indeed, one of the Greek, Greek words for fornicate was uh, Corinthia zomai, uh, a word derived from the city's name. So Corinthia zomai. And before the Romans resettled the city in 44 BC, it was known as a particularly promiscuous location. Uh, with cults dedicated to Aphrodite, Apollo, Demeter, Thesmophoros, Hera, Poseidon, and Helios. However, special attention was paid to Aphrodite, the goddess of love and protectress, protectress of the city. Her temple overlooking the hill uh, on, on the city supposedly housed over 1,000 sacred prostitutes. So some scholars debate as to whether or not that was still true during the Roman rule of the city, but there is no doubt that as a city of central importance and commercial impact, there was a heavy influence of sexual perversion. And this is the environment into which Paul is addressing his church. This is where he's writing the letter to. And I would submit that it's honestly not too far from where we find ourselves today. If I were to ask you guys what was the number one uh, sexual temptation in America, and even you can go to the world today if you wanted to, what would you say? Number one. Anything. Infidelity, I got pornography. I would submit it was pornography. According, and we have some of the stats, according to Family Safe Media, the average first age of pornography exposure is 11. 90% of 8 to 16 year olds have viewed pornography, most while doing homework. The largest consumer group of pornography users is the 35 to 49 year old age group, with a 72 to 28% breakout of male to female users, respectively. So this is not just a, a purely male problem. And we as Americans, this is the one that kind of blew me away, produce 89% of all commercial pornography websites. Every one of us in this room via smartphone is even about 10 seconds away from accessing pornography, even while we're sitting here in church today. This is supposed to be the safest place there is. This is supposed to be a church, and yet we are still right on the precipice of sin due to the ease and accessibility of sexual immorality. Back in the day, you'd have to go find this stuff, and now it finds you. We have a generation coming of age now, and therefore every subsequent generation after that, that will not know of a world unsaturated and unsurrounded by sexual temptation. So I feel like we can identify with the environment that Paul is speaking to. I feel like in a way, he's speaking to us. It's a very practical application. Uh, just as, a, a, as an example of that, growing up, I was always involved in sports. I played everything from backyard baseball, football, basketball, as well as organized leagues. I'd spend entire days outside just playing sports because that's all I really wanted to do. And one day after a game, I was just talking with the guys. Normally the conversation would fall on the most recent acquisition by the Rays, or maybe the game we just finished playing. And uh, even sometimes it was about the chances that the Bucks had of winning on a Sunday, because back then they actually had a chance of winning on a given Sunday. Uh, but one time, with just the guys around, I asked a serious question. Where had they learned about sex? Some of them had had the talk uh, with their dads. Others had learned it from sex ed in school. But every single one of them, every single one of them had viewed pornography. It was educating them more than their parents or their schools, if you even believe that it's the school's responsibility to be the ones to teach that. We are clearly failing as a culture at avoiding sexual immorality. And it should hit a special home for us here in Tampa, because uh, in America, I believe Tampa Bay is the number one city per capita uh, with uh, strip clubs per capita. We are number one in the United States. So if 
you don't think this is going on here, it, you know, this is, this is what's happening. This is where we are at. And one thing that gets me fired up about our church in a, in a good way, and I hope that comes across to you all that I, I love our church here, is the openness we have in addressing that sexual immorality overall. Uh, I'm in an accountability group with a couple of guys here, and being on the leadership team with the church is another level of accountability. Pornography and sexual immorality thrive in darkness and solitude. When there is no light shining in that area of our lives, that perversion can grow every day. I think uh, Casting Crowns even had a song, right? Uh, Daddies are not lost in a day. This is a gradual process. If you're looking for a place to hold you accountable on improving that area of your life and repenting from a sexually immoral habit, no matter what it may be, then you've come to the right place. I know that Joe, myself, Jeremy, Wes, Terry, the guys on the team, uh, we'd be happy to have you in our accountability groups. And for the ladies, I know you guys are starting up a a, a group. Um, You can see Teresa or Mackenzie about getting involved with that. We're a church that recognizes that none of us is perfect, but each of us is there to help us to help each one of us be better husbands, wives, parents, and friends. And Paul knows how strong sexual temptation is and how big of a deal it is for the church in Corinth. Corinth, yeah. So his solution is for the people reading the letter to get married rather than to burn with that passion. And marriage is the only place where that level of passion is able to grow in a positive way. Too many times we think it's awkward to talk about sex, especially to God, but he doesn't think so. He even gave us the Song of Solomon in the Old Testament to serve as an incredible example of what sexual intimacy is supposed to look like. It's close, it's hot, it's satisfying, but it starts with a recognition that we do not belong to ourselves in a marriage covenant. We are surrendering our authorities over our own bodies and presenting them to our spouses. And despite these concessions regarding marriage, Paul actually says that it is better for the unmarried and widows to stay single so as to provide a singular focus on honoring God instead of also having to honor their spouse. And so uh, back into the passage, again, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 8 through 11. uh, Verse 8, Now to the unmarried and widows I say this, It is good for them to stay unmarried as I do, but if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married I give this command, not I but the Lord, A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. Paul clearly shows here that he believes marriage is a way to avoid sexual immorality by applying the passion in the confines of marriage. But if you have the self-control to avoid that pitfall, then it is better to wholly commit yourself, wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly commit yourself to the mission of Christ. You get into married life, and you become focused on providing for your spouse and your family, emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially. The majority of your pursuits become centered around them, which can be a good thing. Uh, Vanessa and I have asked Joe and Teresa for a recommendation to go through another marriage enrichment book, to which they suggested the book uh, titled Marriage the Way It's Ought to Be by Ken Ortiz. Early on in the book, the author states, quote, It has been my personal experience that marriage has been the most effective means in my life to reveal what a sinner I am and how gracious God is. It is marriage that has taught me the most about what it means to love unconditionally, faithfully, and consistently. And I'm sure to the the married folks in the room, there there is uh, no better refinement experience than being able to look across the table at your spouse who has made a very valid point that you cannot combat and going, yes, dear, I'll work on that. Uh, but that, that last line in the, quote, uh, in the quote, to love unconditionally, can sometimes be the hardest element of love in marriage and outside of it. Our sin nature compels us to express love to others to the degree in which we've received love. However, that's no good. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 46 through 48, that if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And true love, as described in the love passage, 1 Corinthians 13, says, It, love, does not not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrong. I think that last part there, it keeps no record of wrong, maybe one of the single most difficult things to adhere to in a marriage or in in any relationship, really. We want to be righted. We want to correct a wrong. We want to hold the grudge. And we want things to be fair. 
and I don't know about what it is about the female kind, but God has apparently given them some sort of superhuman ability for instant memory recall, because I don't know if this has ever happened to you guys, but you ever get crossways of your wife and she might be able to bring up something that you said in passing over two years ago when I can't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday morning. Actually, I came across uh, a while back, <laughs> I came across a comic strip that actually um, perfect, like, perfectly encapsulated this concept. It was a husband and a wife sitting at a, at a kitchen table. The wife had her back turned to the husband. And the husband looks over and goes, sweetie, you're in a bad mood. What, what's the matter with you? She goes, nothing. Is it, <laughs> is it something I said? No. Is it, is it something I didn't say, dear? No. Is it something I did? No. The wife's getting a, you know, a little bit more upset at each question. Is it something I didn't do? No. And the husband sits there for a second and goes, is it something I said in casual reference to something I did when the thing I did shouldn't have been done or at least done differently with more concern for your feelings? She goes, maybe. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> While there are definitely refinements that can come from being married, Paul specially addresses the unmarried as well. For those of you who are unmarried, it's not some sort of curse. There isn't something wrong. Paul specifically says that it is good to stay unmarried and only to get married so as to not burn with passion. That was what he said is his opinion. However, he distinctly says that the Lord addresses currently married folks when he says that a wife must not separate from her husband and a husband must not separate, uh, must not divorce his wife. I think we can all agree that a Christian marriage is one of the most public examples of Christ's love that we can express. Baptism is a public proclamation of our individual commitments to God, and marriage is a public proclamation of our individual commitments to each other with God as our witness. Every time a Christian couple gets a divorce, it can serve as a splinter in the foundation of what we're trying to show to an unbelieving world. And if God uses the example as, uh, when expressing his relationship to the church, such as in Ephesians 5.25 or in Revelation 19, then you know it's a model that he believes in. Married believers are called to be that example, which is all the more reason why Satan is going to try and get in between you by any means necessary. Now, please hear me out on this. I want to, I want to clarify a very particular point. I am not saying that if you've gone through a divorce that you've sinned or that you're the problem. In fact, if you've gone through a divorce, then you are in the best place for you. You were in the right place this morning. You've come to the only place that can address all of the wounds that you've suffered. The beauty of Christ's message is that he can provide the reconciliation and healing that is desperately needed at ground zero of those moments. I'm purely saying that the biggest attack in the life of a married couple is going to come at the foundation of the marriage. If you're currently married or if you're engaged or if you intend to just simply one day get married, you need to already be preparing yourself for the onslaught that Satan is going to bring to your doorstep. And he is most assuredly going to bring it. One of the biggest ways in aiding your marriage before it even begins is in evaluating your future spouse to see if there's someone you can spend the rest of your life with. Duh, Christian, right? Uh, obviously, you can't address all of the concerns beforehand, but preparation is the key. I know when Vanessa and I were engaged, uh, our church had us go through a class centered around the book Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts. We also studied uh, The Five Love Languages by Dr. Gary Chapman in our own time. Both books I would highly recommend. Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts initiated the dialogue between Vanessa and me, prompting us to ask questions of each other and ourselves that we wouldn't have thought of before. Well, she may have thought of them. I was just kind of walking around at that time, just going, you're so pretty, why are you marrying me? But uh, my mind wasn't exactly in the most logical state at the time. Uh, in fact, we're going through, in the Guys Accountability Group, we're going through a book, Wild at Heart, where the author states that there is nothing more inspiring to a man as a beautiful woman, and I can certainly attest to that. But Vanessa and I came clean of any transgressions from our past and opened up all of our finances for the other person to see. Thankfully, there, uh, neither of us had any kind of debt to carry into the relationship outside of my car loan, but other people don't always have that benefit. I cannot urge you enough, if you're going into that next stage of your life, discuss your debt. Personally, I would argue that discussing your complete financial situation is just as important as your sexual background. If you don't discuss your finances, the other person is signing into an arrangement that they're not seeing the full picture. I'm not saying that you shouldn't marry because they have credit card debt. I'm just saying that all the cards need to be on the table, both figurative and plastic. Yeah, see what I did there? See what I did there? There you go. We see this too often in my line of work. 
uh, where debt and finances can erode in a marriage until the couple is at each other's throats trying to see where the money is going or in some cases where it's already gone. Uh, there's even a specific example that comes to mind. Uh, I'm not making any of this up, okay? Because I don't think that you can. Uh, we, there's actually quite a few stories working in the financial sector that you would just blow your mind. But we provide, so at, at work, we provide financial planning for all types of services, one of which is retirement planning, personal retirement planning. Normally for those types of meetings, we prefer to have both spouses present at the meeting because the plan will only succeed if both partners buy into the plan, right? You can't plan for retirement when one person is saving all the money and the other person is spending it or in a lot of situations where both of them are spending it. Well, the guy, the husband comes in, and right off the bat, we ask him if his wife will be joining us, a specific recommendation that we make at the time we set every appointment. He says, oh no, she won't be coming in today. She's actually out shopping. She's something of a shopaholic. Should have been the first clue, but we went on. So now normally, we have to start these types of meetings off by establishing with the client at a, at a very basic level a set of specific goals that they'd like to accomplish, right? Because nothing is going to get accomplished without set specific goals that are bought into by both parties. Well, he actually came prepared with his own specific goals, which again is, is actually a little unusual. So good on him. One of which was to retire in five years with a couple million dollars. Now this guy was in his mid-40s, uh, so that's a fairly ambitious goal, but certainly not unattainable. We concluded the meeting, and he left us his financial records for us to tabulate what it would take for him to reach his specific goal. Well, we started going through the records, and it turned out he didn't actually already have a couple million dollars set aside. Nor did he even have a couple thousand dollars set aside. This guy was in debt. Apparently, both he and his wife appreciated the finer things in life and weren't taking any steps to prepare for the future, either individually or collectively. So this left my boss with the unfavorable task of informing the client that not only was he definitely not going to be retiring in five years, short of a lottery winnings, he was going to have to work much longer than he expected and or seriously downgrade his style of living. So my boss shows up at the guy's house for the meeting, you know, basically to bring him the bad news. And uh, as the client is leading him into the kitchen, right, client opens the door, you know, hey, they're walking into the kitchen to have the meeting. Um, my boss asked him, so how's your son doing? And the guy just stops and turns around and goes, who told you about my son? The boss is like, uh, you did at our last meeting. We talked about your son. Goes, oh, okay. All right, cool. So walking on. Obviously, my boss looks over him and goes, so um, anything up? Anything, anything going on? He goes, yeah. I'm sorry, man. Yeah. My son is moving back in with us this week, along with his girlfriend, who's pregnant. It's like, mm. We're meeting the in-laws this weekend. Um, her dad's a pastor. But that's my problem. That's my problem, man. At least my finances are good, right? <laughs> at, which, at which point, my boss looks over and goes, trying to, always trying to be professional, right? But he just looks over this time and goes, oh, no, man. <laughs> oh, no. You're not, not only are you not going to retire in five years, but we're going to have to recommend putting you both on a, on a very tight spending plan just to get you out of your debt. <laughs> and the guy, again, meeting hasn't even started yet. Guy just stops there and looks at him and goes, oh, forget it all, come on. <laughs> and it goes in there and they have the rest of the meeting. They're very awkward meeting. Long way to describe what good can come from both partners being on the same plan when it comes to your finances, both before and during the marriage. And the other helpful resource we had was the five love languages. In the book, the author details five different ways by which individuals receive and share love. These five ways were via words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. The author, Dr. Gary Chapman, shared his reasoning on how each one of us falls into one or several of the different languages, but with always one primary. Based upon that person's individual love language, they would interact with the world around them. He said that too often as a marriage counselor, he saw upset, frustrated couples sitting on his couches complaining, individually because he would separate them for this portion of the interview. That's all, each of them would say that all I do is show him love, or all I do is show her love, and I get nothing back. They're like rocks, I, nothing. The problem would be that the husband fell into one category while the wife fell into another. For example, I'm an acts of service person, whereas Vanessa is a quality time individual. The best scenario I can think of was back in our first year of marriage. Vanessa was in grad school and would have late night classes a couple of nights a week. 
uh, even wor after working full days either in the clinic or, um, or with classes. On the nights she had class, I would get home before her and try to cook a dinner for her. I now consider myself something of a chef, but that passion of mine was discovered in those early days. And I say discovered, I was not good, it was bad, but it, it worked, it worked out. But regardless, I would try to have some fancy romantic dinners for her planned when, when she got home. There might be roses on the table. There was candles one time, but I don't think that worked out very well. It like gave this really weird aroma while we're trying to eat. I was like, let's just shut that down. That's not working, that's not working. So trying, they were, they were good attempts, they were good attempts. But again, unfortunately she would get home sometimes before the dinners were complete. Uh, but I figured that'd be okay, right? Because I mean, this was gonna be awesome. These were gonna be legit and totally worth it. But when she's basically starved all day, running around from class to class or from work to class, dealing with screaming kids, the last thing she wanted to do was wait another 30 to 45 minutes for dinner, whereas a number six combo from Wendy's would have done the trick just as well. And for those of you who don't know Vanessa, she has something that we like to affectionately call the hunger monster. Now, the hunger monster can strike at a moment's notice, uh, but if you're vigilant, you can spot the warning signs. Usually, a hunger monster attack will be preceded by a couple of seemingly innocuous and by the way comments such as, you thinking about dinner tonight? Or, when do you think you're gonna be hungry? Just, just checking. These are, not, these are not innocent questions. These are warning alarms signaling the approach of the hunger monster. So by keeping Vanessa waiting an extra 30 to 45 minutes, she would start to get a little snappy with me. I know, hard to believe, right? Snappy with me or angry with me because all she wanted to do was sit down, eat, talk, and maybe watch a TV show. I would become discouraged because it didn't seem like she even appreciated that I went through all this hard work to cook for her, burning several things in the process. But in reality, she was more interested in eating just so we could get to the good part, the quality time. In retrospect, it was just a simple miscommunication. I was expressing my love through acts of service. She was looking to express her love through quality time. Over time, we both have learned how to give love in the other person's language while still receiving love in our own. And yet, in addition to the resources that I've suggested here today, there are still some other ways for you to evaluate your potential spouse. One thing the Corinthians had going for them was that they were a center of philosophy and abstract thinking a hub where accomplished minds would come together and challenge one another to examine the world around them. Similarly, we are blessed with philosophers today of this caliber. For example, the great philosopher by the name of Will Ferrell once recommended that before you marry a person, you should first make them use a computer with slow internet just to see who they really are. <laughs> and another sage of our time, Mindy Kaling, shared her views. True love is singing the karaoke song under pressure and letting the other person sing the Freddie Mercury part. <laughs> like I said, what a time to be alive. But back to the gospel, uh, after, after, there was a long divergent over there. Uh, after Paul had addressed why you should marry and after speaking to the unmarried and widows, he also sp specifically addresses the believer who'd be reading his letter who finds themselves as the only believer in the marriage. So back to the scriptures for the last chunk of today, verses, uh, this is again, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 12 through 20. Verse 12, to the rest I say this, I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified <laughs> through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The, brothers, the brother or, sis, or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God, God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? Then he should not become uncircumcised. Which I'm not even quite sure how you do that. But was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not become circumcised. Thank God. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. As I said earlier today, Christ uses the worldly example of marriage to be the illustration of his love. 
However, some people don't have the benefit of sharing that blessing with another Christ follower. Here, Paul specifically tells them how to approach that kind of a circumstance. Uh, Verse 17 again, Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. If that's you today, you may feel like you're alone. You may feel like you're trying to live out your life according to a set of standards that your spouse does not adhere to. And I assure you, if you're feeling that kind of alone, that the scout can feel alone in the woods, but that's because they're leading the army behind them. God did not save you to leave you on an island. He saved you to be the beacon that no one else can be for the people around you, even in your immediate family. We are called to live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to us. That may be a tall task, but that is again why I hope you're here today. To get a refuel on your mission and to rest in the oasis that is Christ's church and Christ's body and Christ's congregation here today. I commend you for being that light and I hope to encourage you by saying that you're not alone. That every single one of us here has your back, which still pales in comparison to the leadership and direction provided by the one true God. Mackenzie, if you want to start heading up. I know, um, I know we've covered a lot of information here today, and I really appreciate you guys hanging with me on a, a series of really fine points that I've been trying to make. But as I said in the opening, I'm very humbled to be able to stand up here and deliver this message to you today, but I am in no way the most qualified person to give this message, even in this room. No matter what stage of life you find yourself in, whether single, dating, engaged, married, divorced, or widowed, you're in the right place. We are blessed here to have in our congregation people who have gone through each of those situations. If you're looking for help or just someone that you can bounce ideas off of, please speak to myself or Joe after the service. We can get you plugged in with the right people. Our church may be young, it may be new, but the Lord has sent us people with the wisdom to share into the exact type of situation that you find yourself in. God's relationship with his son and the church gives us the perfect example of every relationship that we could ask for. His redemption and grace show us that life isn't fair and that we should be glad that it isn't. Because in no universe is it fair for us to mess up, for us to sin, and for the creator of heaven and earth to have to send his perfect and blameless son to die on the cross to take us of those sins. If that's not the most perfect example of what love is, then I'm not quite sure what is. And if you need that kind of love, if you want to be part in that kind of a relationship, then you can make that commitment today. I'm not going to lead you in some sort of a special prayer because there isn't one. You just need to commit yourself to the Lord, repent and turn from the sins that you've you've been committing and follow Him. Afterwards, share your decision with somebody and we we can arrange to have you baptized and begin in a formal way that new life in Him. This new life is not uh, easy, a promise of easy living or of a smoother walk, but it is a life that affords us personal satisfaction and peace based on blessing from a reigning Christ. The Greek scholar Spiros Zodhaitis said that, quote, to be happy is to have favorable circumstances, but to be blessed is to find full satisfaction in the indwelling Christ, and, the, and one is unaffected by the outward circumstances. It is to have the peace of God within spite of possible affliction from without. The blessed person is one who is made satisfied because of God's presence within him, no matter how much health or prosperity he or she possesses. If you're looking to have that kind of satisfaction, that kind of blessing in your life today, then all it takes is for you to give your life past, present, and future up to him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you and once again just thank you for every single soul in this room, every single person in this room that has come here to to be connected with you in some form or fashion, Lord. Some people might not even know why they came in today, uh, or they might not know that what it is that they're specifically seeking for, but Father, no matter what it is, you provide it. You provide us a blessed life in the arms uh, of your son Jesus who died on the cross for our sins, and Lord, we can't thank you enough for that kind of sacrifice and that kind of commitment that you made to each and every single one of us individually. So Lord, I pray again for every single person here. I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would be with them, encourage them, and strengthen them. Make them bold to go through here. If nothing else, to, to be bold enough to know and to have the strength to ask for the help that they may sorely need from you, Lord. 
We love you. We thank you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.